Thank you very much, Jean. Appreciate the, the introduction. I'm Crystal. He's Leland. <laughs> Just so you know. We, uh, the, the beginnings of this book, you know, go back. My, my ancestry probably came up the Osage River in the, in the 1850s and were, uh, my grandmother was born in Old Lynn Creek, Missouri. So um, I have a long history with, with the watershed. But uh, what pr promoted this book was I, I and uh, Dr. Rollins Sparrow initiated a lawsuit with the help of the Environmental Defense Fund in a futile effort to stop Truman Dam in the early 70s. And uh, I won't get into too much of that. And I, I, I didn't, when we did this book, I said, I don't want to repeat the kind of books that Confederate generals wrote that are full of uh, sour grapes. <laughs> You know, so we, we tried to be really objective, and I think we've achieved it because I haven't had any death threats since the book's been out. <laughs> okay, well, the, the, as you probably know, the headwaters of the Osage River, which of course joins the Missouri about 18 miles from here downstream, uh, but the headwaters start up near Eskridge, Kansas, in, um, in the eastern slope of the Flint Hills. It's a little creek, but it becomes a larger one, and, and eventually in Kansas, uh, you know, it crosses into Missouri and joins the Little Osage. Um, it goes through uh, the prairie border area and uh, runs along the uplift that the, where the Ozarks meets the, the prairies. And there's where you can see where it joins the Missouri River. This is the Missouri, and that's the Osage. So. Um, it's about 500 miles long, and it's uh, a region of small towns be from beginning to end. Ottawa, Kansas is the largest uh, community on the Osage. It's about 12,000 uh, population. The, um, the, Missouri, it, the Osage is one, of the, is one of the larger contributors to the Missouri River. It is, uh, rivals the Yellowstone river in terms of the amount of water it, it puts into the uh, Missouri, but it only drains 15,300 miles, which is square miles, which, and that's the area right down there in the corner. Okay, these black dots, if you can see them, are where we visited and took pictures. Our, our method of history is actually, we're, we're not scholars, neither of us have any education in, <laughs> in history or anything, but we just like to take pictures of areas that interest us, so, so we travel throughout the entire basin and there are pictures from, from all this area. So, you know, there is a kind of uh, personalized National Geographic tone to the book. It's <laughs> Oops, wait a minute, it goes by too quickly, there we go. Um, the main Osage is obliterated by two dams, Bagnell and Truman have taken most of it only 80 miles remain below um, Bagnell Dam between Bagnell and the Missouri River that are, uh, is still free flowing and that has lo what we, is called Lock and Dam Number One, which was the first uh, water impediment, the first dam built on the Osage. Um, and let's see, <clears throat> this is Younger's Bluff, which is on the um, middle Osage up near Warsaw. <coughs> yep. This is skipped. Yeah, these up there. The, this is a this, touchy this thing. This is uh, on the on the left. These are these are catch pots dug by the French to uh, store uh, Osage Indian hides and probably their own gunpowder and things. It's up in the Osage River. Uh, and then on the right is the remains of an ill-conceived Osage ironworks in the in the 1880s. So there's, there's very little actual relics of, of the early occupation. So we did have to resort to historical documents for that kind of thing. But go ahead. But when we get into uh, the present era, there, you know, there's uh, the American occupation. There, there's a pretty great continuity between, there's quite, this is a catfish river. There are large catfish in the Osage River then and there are now. One of the uh, most interesting things is Mark Twain almost married a girl from Warsaw, Missouri. That would have changed our whole book. 
<laughs> had we had, you know, a Huck Finn on the Osage River, this would have been a better book because I, I love Mark Twain. Okay. Um, the, the Osage Indians were the, uh, are the group for, uh, for which the river is named, and uh, they occupied this land before this area, before the uh, French and the Spanish came here. They modified the landscape itself by burning the prairies intentionally, uh, periodically. Although now, today, as you probably know, only fragments of the original prairies remain. Um, this is Taborville Prairie which is preserved by the Missouri Prairie Foundation and the Missouri <laughs> Department of Conservation. Today, the Upper Osage and its tributaries are intensively farmed and uh, is mostly row crops now, and rather pasture. than and pasture. Yes. Is that, is that, this is really touchy. The, yeah. uh, we, we've got quite a bit in the Os about the Osage Indians. Uh, not only are they uh, you know, a, a fantastic, interesting story, uh, they're, they're ill-conceived. One thing, they, they didn't eat fish and they didn't like to travel by river, which, which a lot of bad history has them eating fish and then going down in their birch bark canoes and their dugouts. But they were uh, uh, extremely uh, realistic. Go ahead. And you skip one. What? Skip one. There. There we go. Their, their, uh, their area of domination was huge. They were, they were a fearsome group, by the way, and no one knows where the Osage came from. They showed up only shortly before the French discovered them at the headwaters of the Osage River in Missouri. Where they came from, no one knows, but they were a Sioux and tribe, and they worked the uh, plains, as Crystal said, burning the prairies, which, which expanded the tall grass prairie region. But they're, they're, uh, they put a, an end to the French and Spanish designs to have extensive colonies in this part of the world. They, they would trade with them, but they, they discouraged, they had the military power and enforced it. They were ruthless enforcers of their territory. Good. I got it. Right. <laughs> they, uh, they resisted making war on the Europeans. They were a lot more strategic in their uh, planning. They recognized the overwhelming odds against which they uh, were faced. So um, they decided to negotiate and trade. They used commerce, barter, more than any other techniques in order to uh, maintain their influence over a large area. They were feared and hated by other tribes. I mean, that particular strategy was focused on the Europeans who were coming in. They were not uh, afraid to fight with the uh, other Indians, and they were feared and hated by other tribes. The Shotos who founded St. Louis were very much um, um, friends of the Osages, they had, um, Pierre and his brother had uh, Osage wives for when they were traveling. Their political savvy con contributed to their current wealth today. They are down in Osage County, Oklahoma, uh, primarily oil and land sales that have made them rich. But they negotiated the trade-off of their lands to uh, encroaching Americans very, uh, very strategically through the decades that they were forced to migrate farther west. They, they were rich before they discovered a large pool right. of oil when they, when they sold their land. They're just, they were just sagacious and, and picked the right side. They liked the Americans and have never, never raised a, a tomahawk to them. The um, um, Harmony Mission, which is down on the Osage River near Papinville, uh, the site of it is, there's no relic of it left today, but Harmony Mission was uh, established at the request of the Osages to have the Great White Fathers send um, uh, missionaries to educate their children. And it was a small outpost on, on um, the, the Osage, just above Papers. <coughs> and it's still, there's still a local history society down there who, that carry on the tradition. They take people out to see it, as we did. Um, Okay. And the, uh, the Upper Osage is, uh, th these, there's some small towns that are in the same situation as many agricultural communities today. It, it, it is unbelievably ironic that there, at one time there were 6,000 6, Osage Indians dominating that area you saw the map of four or five states. And this is the civilization that was left behind. 
So it, it's, uh, this whole study is, uh, takes into account the uh, changing nature of resource values when we got into the, to the era of damming it, uh, you learn that what, what, what's a value to one's era of civilization is not necessarily a value again. And one of the problems we have when we get to, uh, to the damming thing is that it seems to lock a resource in to a very long period of, of usage. And this isn't necessarily uh, prudent. Okay. But there are a lot of things we've got in the book. We love bridges, old bridges, so we may, it has nothing to do with the water resources. What's very minimal. They go over water, but we just like them, so we put them in the book. Actually, the um, bridges, uh, the river itself was transportation, but rivers were also an obstruction to transportation. So that was our excuse for putting bridges in. One of the coolest groups are the Joe Dice suspension bridges down in the. Uh, along the, the Osage, he had a fifth grade education, and yet he figured out how, out how to build suspension bridges that would cross both Little Creeks and uh, there's even one still remaining at Warsaw, which is on the main stem of the Osage, uh, which is now a pedestrian bridge, but it was in use as a highway bridge even up into the 70s. So, um, the, okay. <coughs> And then there's like iron bridges, <clears throat> which are quickly vanishing. So just within the time after we finished the book, one of our favorites fell into the Osage River. The iron bridge at Shell City. We, we did a video on it, actually. So. Um, okay. More iron bridges and yeah. more. There's a lot, of, a lot of local history. One of the things when they started doing these impoundments, the presumption was that there was nothing there. Central governments do not necessarily see resources the same way that people living there. So there wasn't much record of these things. And uh, uh, we, we want to restore the idea. There, it was densely cared about. I mean, cared about and occupied. And there was very little uh, concern for that either in Europe or in Washington, D.C. when they build these reservoirs. The local people be damned. Literally. Um, Kaplinger Mills, which is down near Stockton, a little bit north of Stockton, was, um, you know, every new community, as people gathered together in a small community, would need a grist mill on the, in the a pioneer era. And uh, Kaplinger Mills on the Sac River, which is a tributary of the Osage, uh, was a big operation. The landowner um, installed the first hydroelectric uh, unit there in, in 1917. And in the, it's been, it's now a historic site. There, the hydropower options are all gone, but the iron bridge still crosses it. It's a pedestrian bridge, people camp. It's a lovely site actually, but it was our first, um, first hydropower project here. Another uh, colossal mistake yeah. was the effort to uh, ditch the upper Osage River to run the water off fast enough to turn it into uh, Egypt. I think it was, <laughs> it was said to be the Delta of Egypt was a, was a model. But of course, uh, it wasn't hydrologically sound. And it was uh, like many of these uh, water resource development schemes are, are, are driven by the, the mechanical aspect of, of, of doing them. The, the joy is in building the dam or digging the ditch that's exciting. And there's a lot of money to be made if you're a construction company or if you're loaning money to somebody to do it. This was, by the way, opposed tremendously by most farmers, but the county courts uh, at that time had the right to, uh, to do this stuff undemocratically. So it's, it's a mess up there. And it- uh, The Bates County ditch cost $375,000 back at the turn of the last century, early in the last century. And it was, uh, it's still a source of contention down there and has obviously changed the hydrology of the river itself. That's a marshy area where the three, the Osage, the Little Osage, and the Meridacine all come together. And um, that was their point in trying to drain it, but it's, it's caused no end of problems and we think it had something to do with the fall in of the Shell City Bridge. <laughs> The second uh, hydroelectric power generation on the Osage River uh, tributaries 
area was the uh, at Osceola. There used to be a little run of the river dam there, um, which was a great place for fishing, obviously, as it blocks the, it was only about 14 feet high. It was built in the late 20s and it, by Ozark Utilities Company, I believe out of Folliver. It was finished um, shortly before Bagnell was begun, and it was a popular paddlefish snagging area as well. The uh, spawning beds, the <coughs> spawning beds for the paddlefish lie between, or lay between uh, Osceola and Warsaw on that stretch of the Osage. Now, all that area is now under uh, Truman Dam, as you know. So, um, out on the main part of the Osage, um, up, uh, about 10 miles upstream from the confluence with the Missouri River is Lock and Dam Number One. It was built um, in the 18. Work was begun in 1895 and completed in 1906. It was the first Corps of Engineers project on the Osage River, and uh, it's 800. The first dam. They, they had tried. To, they had tried to deepen the Osage River for steamboats, which the Indians told them wasn't a good idea. <laughs> and they were right. The, the Indians uh, had no pony in the fight, you know, <laughs> so they, they were very realistic about it. And, uh, but the early people viewed the Osage at one time would be a, a normal outlet. If they could just get steamboats up far enough, it would be the overland uh, point of trade to Santa Fe in the Southwest. Mm -hmm. And of course, it was usurped by by uh, Westport because the Osa the Missouri River is a more dependable source of, of transportation. So this was a, 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 a an unbelievably ignorant effort to to create steamboating. At, and after the Civil War, there was very little profitable steamboating anyway, and it actually retarded the amount of use of. Uh, because the one, the one use the Osage River was is rafting uh, ties down to the junction, down to uh, Osage City to put on railroads. And this blocked the tie rafts. But it was designed by a great Corps of Engineers uh, who became a general upon retirement, Hiram Chittenden, who was uh, a Renaissance man who wrote uh, a number of uh, books that are still in print on the history of the fur trade in the upper Missouri River. But he, he did it, he, he was writing his books, not paying attention to his dam because immediately upon <laughs> construction, one side of it fell apart. It took 20 years to get it back together. But it's still there blocking navigation, occasionally drowning boaters and blocking the paddlefish and the, the pallid sturgeon from having access to possible spawning grounds on that 80 miles of the remaining Osage River between its mouth and Bagnell Dam. So it ought to be, it ought to come out. Which is part of, part of the illustration we have up here is when uh, just a few, a couple of years ago, remember when we had a drought and the rivers got very low? This, the photograph or the illustration in that, which you can look at afterwards, is, shows the, the, what remains of the concrete, um, uh, infrastructure for that dam thoroughly exposed in the in the water because it's just barely underneath the water right now. Okay, now we're so. going to get into the most controversial part of it, the building of the big dams, Bagel Dam being the first. Yes. Um, of course, I, I wouldn't be here had it not been built because <laughs> my father was a highway engineer from Kentucky and he came into the area uh, in the uh, middle 30s to, to work on roads that needed to be reconstructed around Lake of the Ozarks, and my mother was uh, from Versailles. My grandfather ran a newspaper in Versailles, so <coughs> that's how I came, so it's ironic. Yeah. Anyway, um, the, when Bagnell, Old Lynn Creek is the seat of, uh, was the seat of Camden County. It had a population of about 500. It was a steamboat port, uh, landing town, and it had a, a very educated and a smart newspaper editor. The Reveille was the uh, name of the paper, and J.W. Vincent was the editor, who with uh, Morgan Mulder, M-O-U-L-D-E-R, uh, was a young firebrand lawyer, just recently graduated from the University of Missouri Law School, um, tried to fight Bagnell Dam, and either reduce its size or, or 
prevent it from being built altogether, but we know how that turned out. One, one of the side effects, one of the good side effects of doing this book is, is the privilege of reading old newspaper <laughs> columns and letters from early Missouri politicians who were by today's standard uh, Shakespeare. I mean, they, they were brilliant and had metaphors, had widely read. The idea that they were all just uh, hillbillies down in the, uh, in the Ozarks is not, is not true. They were uh, superb writers and, and almost to the person uh, of a very high moral character. Anyway, unlike uh, the people who wanted to build the dam, <laughs> <laughs> there's a point of view. Who were crooks? <laughs> yeah. Um, the uh, so let's see. We're, that's Lynn Creek. Let's see. Yeah. Speaking of the people who wanted to build the dam, uh, up here. Whoops. Sorry. What, that, is that, what does that guy on the lower left look like to you? <laughs> Walking out into a bunch of press photographers pulling his coat up over his head. Okay, uh, well that is Walter Cravens. Um, this is his picture, er, he was uh, one, one of the 100 influential men in Kansas City in one of those big folio type books that they had every 10 years or something in 1925. This is 1931, I believe, when he was uh, headed off to trial for his shenanigans. But he ran the Kansas City Land Bank uh, and was at the time, late, building. yeah, in the late 20s, he was getting a lot, he was foreclosing on a lot of land in Kansas. Farmers, guess what, the, depre the, the depression hit agriculture before it hit the, the cities. And um, <coughs> farmers, farms were folding in Kansas, the Dust Bowl was beginning. And so he had a lot of paper from Kansas and he, this, by the way, is his building. It's across the street from the main library in Kansas City on West 10th Street. That was the building that Walter Cravens built for his land bank. And that is the building in which he was arrested. But he and a Kansas City lawyer, Ralph W. Street, who wasn't, who wasn't a crook. Was not a crook. Uh, Street had always had a vision of making money through hydropower and, and of damming rivers. So he uh, had been looking for rivers to dam, and he and Street got together and decided that they could build a dam at, the, at uh, where it is now, where Bagnell is now, and tried to put money together as a scheme wherein he would swap the foreclosed Kansas farms to the people whose farms were going to be flooded by this Project 459, which is what they call it uh, still today. <laughs> Um, Project 459 on, on the Osage River. Getting that scheme, building the dam, and then uh, selling the land, re real the real estate to people to be on the lake was probably, we don't have any personal confirmation of it, but was probably his vision of how to get out of the mess he was in with his land bank. Unfortunately, the feds caught up with him before he was able to pull the scheme together because he was never able to find the fu financing to get the data and, built. And he was diverting funds, you know, from, from his land bank to in, into this scheme. And it would have been impossible for these guys probably to have built this dam. They were not that, if it didn't stop them from trying. They had a local construction company who was going to build this dam. So he got in trouble with his, with his land bank and had to sell it out to a, a group called Union Electric, and they were anything but uh, incapable, but they were also crooks. <laughs> so, well, you know, so there's Cravens and, and his- There he is later. There he is there. That, this is his mugshot from when he went to um, Leavenworth. And this is Mr. Egan, Louis Egan, who was the uh, president of Union Electric. Who, who also did time in the Federal Slammer. Yeah. He is the one who built Wilmore Lodge. He brought, he viewed the construction site at uh, Bagnall and the lake to come as his own private playground. And he managed to get away with it for some time because it wasn't until the 40s that they were able to fully thin him down. But he, he was diverting uh, money from various sources, not only probably into his own pocket, which was never proven, but he was using it to bribe uh, uh, newspaper men and, and county and state officials in order to acquire their, their small municipal power companies. 
So he, he went, he did four years in the slammer over, over, over bribery. This is, we will, we'll have, what time is it? We're, we're fine. Are we we're fine. fine? Yeah, we're fine. One of the real uh, beautiful things, uh, one of the great, greatest state park in Missouri, in my opinion, is Ha Ha Tonka, and that has also a story involving people involved in high misdemeanors. Uh, the, the Snyder that started it was killed in a car wreck in, in 1906, one of the very first people to die in a car wreck, and uh, he acquired this gorgeous piece of pro karsh property with caves. I'm sure you're all familiar with Ha Ha Tonka State Park. And it, uh, it plays into the story of, of, of water resource development in the Osage River because his sons uh, were unhappy with the lake of the Ozarks backing up into their trout lake. They had a small trout lake that was fed by the monster spring. And uh, they, they had formerly been actually uh, friends with uh, uh, Egan. So they had a they had a historic trial, two trials, and just just well educated, fairly well off people battering heads with with lawyers of, of, of nationwide reputation. The the the, the Snyder family had uh, Senator uh, what was his name? James A. Reed. Yeah, James A. Reed. Uh, uh, silver-tongued orator from the old days on, on their side, and the, and the Union Electric <clears throat> hired a firm from Texas that was equally uh, competent. But they, they, this was the first real serious uh, <coughs> challenge to, to a project, and it was only only the damage that they were suffering from losing their trout like It wasn't over the whole project. The people in Lynn Creek wanted to get it at uh, at Union Electric for, for building a lake and flooding their little village. See, the Union, uh, old Lynn Creek is under 40 feet of water, so they had to move it to Camdenton, a brand new town. And they, but they had no basis. They tried to get it in the court, but they didn't have any, any legal way to do it. So Lake of the Ozarks uh, is a uh, recreational benefit because people can build on the shoreline, but it also has uh, uh, has some problems, as people are aware, with uh, with uh, over overbuilding and uh, uh, sewage problems. But it uh, it's a thriving tourist thing, which, unlike the Corps of Engineers, I'm sure you all know this, uh, doesn't let people build on the shoreline. Mm -hmm. The lake, the lake of the Ozarks, under Ameren's uh, control, does not have any particular uh, mandate to uh, provide flood control, although they are cooperative uh, on some of that. But they, Bagnell Dam did increase, as you can see, a couple of the uh, issues that were uh, flooding issues downstream from the lake. In the late 40s, there were several that the uh, dam actually aggravated. One of the, one of the <coughs> things, originally when the Corps of Engineers per, proposed dam, building all these dams, the Pick Sloan plan on the Missouri River to protect the Missouri and Mississippi River. Uh, they, were, they were dry dams, in other words, they, they, they had no big permanent pool. So the fluctuation would be 20, 30, 40 feet of shoreline. And this, this uh, made the locals, uh, needless to say, unhappy. There wasn't any recreational benefit whatsoever to them. So they tend to, today, have these big flood control reservoirs, which, by the way, was impossible to store enough water to really bring true flood control to the to the Mississippi Missouri system. So they keep them full of water for recreation, and then when it rains real hard, you've got this tragedy that we've had in the last couple of decades of the Mississippi still going out of its bank and nearly flooding New Orleans and other towns, and, and that's. Some hydrologists think that's an inevitability because there just simply isn't enough places to store water. A full reservoir is of no benefit whatsoever to flood control. In fact, it, it sustains the peak and causes flood damage. I missed There we go. Oh, yeah. All right. Um, lack of silt, you know, the dams will filter out the silt and block it from going downstream is causing things like bank erosion 
below the dam so that there are unintended consequences from these, construct these projects that are never factored into the famous cost-benefit ratio that is uh, provided to And, and there were, there were engineers in the Corps and, that raised these questions. The, these, most of what the ill effects of, of reservoirs and water resource development were predicted by people, but they weren't listened to. And, and a, a bad combination are, are real. You know, the I, once once in the in the 30s, dams began connected, became connected with public employment. You know, and then later they became connected with recreation. The normal uh, constraints were thrown out the window. They had benefits that you couldn't uh, argue with. Okay, that sort of covers the slides. Well, that was the amount of dams that we're going to build. This thing, this thing really, yeah. No, it's got to go back to here. Which one? Mm -hmm. There. Yeah, pe people, uh, people, by the way, initially the governor of Missouri and, and the local uh, powers that be and the county seats opposed these dams because they were clearly for, what, what do they care if they lowered the, the head allegedly at uh, Vicksburg a quarter of an inch? You're, so you're going to take all of our good farmland and you're not going to get pay very much for it and then you're in order to help the, you know, the barge traffic. The original idea was they would have this tremendous amount of storage, which they now don't have by the way, and then, then they would let this water off to sustain the barge traffic, which the Corps of Engineers has inordinately invested in. This barge traffic is, is like uh, the Crusades, you know, and the fact is that it, it's been obsolete for years since the, you know, the big steamboat era. Okay. Uh, but the development of flood control projects such as these uh, dams was really uh, accelerated by the major floods like in 1951, the Kansas City flood. Um, it also, you can see that it also hit Papenville, Missouri. <laughs> it hit about everywhere. The Corps had shifted from a levees only policy prior to, um, in the early part of the century, to damming every stream they could get their hands on. And these sorts of floods, uh, provided justification for the expansion of their damming program. Um, let's see. Boy, this thing is touchy. <laughs> okay. Um, opposition to the two big dams on the upper Osage um, was primarily that good farmland is flooded and uh, taken off of the, the uh, tax rolls. So the, the stage is set at this point for um, what happened next, which was that the, the third, the last big dam to be built on the Osage itself, which was Truman Dam, was uh, in the sites. These are the, ma the major players here. Um, whoops. Damn. Damn. The, uh, Damn or originally, uh, Stuart Symington uh, was lukewarm, to say the least, about Truman Dam. It wasn't called Truman Dam there, it was called Casinger Bluff Dam. But he got talked into it through his... Uh, through Stanley Fight. Stanley Fight was very uh, tight with, he had been a newspaper man in, in western Missouri and he was very tight with a bunch of these local uh, promoters and they... Uh, he was an they, they, they had, be, through this Moar, which, which was headed by uh, Hazler Poe from, from Clinton and his lieutenant Harry Mills who figured into it. I'm not going to get into all the dirty politics of this because <laughs> we, we cover some of it in the book but it's sort of uh, laid. But how this Truman Dam came about, I was uh, gainfully employed at the University of Missouri taking pictures. I was very happy. I got to float the current river and take pretty pictures of this stuff and it was, it was wonderful. But uh, I ran around with a bunch of conservation department biologists who were incensed at this the destruction of the paddlefish and other water, water and other uh, wildlife uh, disbenefits to this Truman Dam project. And then in the upper left, the Raleigh, Dr. Rollin Sparrow was a uh, fearless wildlife biologist uh, with federal government, and he was on top of this. So 
Jim Whiteley uh, flew, uh, there he is, flying the, uh, I, I call the uh, Environmental Defense Fund, and we, we did this at exactly the right moment in time because the uh, Environmental uh, Policy Act. National Environmental Policy Act of 1969, NEPA, which we still use. Required these environmental impact statements, and the idea of the Corps of Engineers for an environmental impact statement on Truman Dam was a page and a half long. At the end of this lawsuit, which went over three years, uh, there was a nine foot stack of orange bound environmental impact statements. If you laid them all up, they would fall over. There was, there was uh, thousands, of, tens of thousands of pages of impact statements. But since the dam had already been started and the courts decided that uh, they wouldn't adjudicate the truth of these statements, they just, you had to, you had to just prepare them. So now the Corps realizes, realized that, oh yes, we're gonna cause all this damage. We, well, okay, we're gonna destroy the paddlefish spawning ground. Well, that's, all, that's, all, that's their obligation. The courts will, will make you say that, but they won't make you stop building the dam. So that was the problem. So we didn't stop the dam after. The courts also made them provide funding for some mitigating uh, activities. Uh, but the, these are the, the um, types of environmental impact statements. And they addressed every area. They talked about economy. They talked about every area of, the, of life and culture that was going to be uh, affected by the dam. Unfortunately, at least now we, there is a record of what was there, what was going to be um, covered up. Okay. So uh, anyway, Leland's role uh, early on, besides contacting the Environmental Defense Fund and um, making a connection with an attorney in Kansas City to give them local standing in the federal court, was also to find plaintiffs to sign on to the lawsuit. Um, his name, of course, was one of them, and there were a number of people who did sign on uh, to be uh, plaintiffs, but eventually w many of them withdrew uh, under some forms of intimidation within their communities. One unintimidatable person was uh, Mr. Whitaker, who owned a bank in Deepwater and was pretty un uh, unimpressed with the... One of the things that I didn't have in the book is just like my father, if they hadn't built Lake of the Ozarks, my father and mother would not gotten together. And if I hadn't been involved in this lawsuit, I wouldn't have met <laughs> Crystal because she was a babysitter for Richard Rhodes, the guy that wrote the making of the atomic bomb. We were friends and that's how we, we met. And he, was in, he was introduced to me in order to write stuff about uh, Truman Dam and, Lake, and the Ozarks. So. It's, it's kind of, these things have, have some, some, our two children wouldn't be here if we, there hadn't been a Truman Dam lawsuit, so it's kind of weird. I. Anyway, the case was also called the Paddlefish case. Uh, it was a, a quick, it was a, something that media people seized on as a, a way to characterize this, this very large federal lawsuit that was going on. Paddlefish, as you may know, is an ancient fish that swims, um, and it's called the shovel fish, and it's got, it's actually, the legal, the scientific name is Polyodon spathula, having to do, of course, with the big, the big uh, snout that he has. Um, and they are a species of approximately 250 million years old that live in the Osage River and in the Missouri system as a whole but have been, they, their spawning beds, the best spawning beds for the species were that section of the river between Osceola and Warsaw, now underwater. But that was one of the bases, uh, the, the destruction of the paddlefish spawning beds was one of the bases on which the complaint was Un written. Unfortunately, that, there's no natural or almost no natural reproduction, <laughs> token reproduction of paddlefish in Missouri due to Truman Dam. And the, the solution, which, which, is, which is necessary, is the conservation of our brilliantly figured out how to spawn them. They had not been artificially propagated uh, before, before this. But there's a problem, a genetic problem, with, uh, with using the same 
fish that have been relocated to Table Rock Lake, they do catch different ones, but there's, there's in other words, the, without the rigor of natural spawning and natural selection, the tendency is to have uh, genetic regression and, and a, uh, eventually you've got kind of a, a domestic animal. But the paddlefish is a, a very successful, they're having this trouble. It's a very successful fish in, in, uh, in Russia and China and throughout. It's a very valuable commercial fish, it has a lot of benefits. It's the fastest growing freshwater fish uh, in the world. And the eggs are extremely a good substitute for caviar and the flesh is delicious. And you may have heard about the caviar uh, poachers. That there was a Russian group that were arrested a couple of years ago. The Russian <laughs> mafia is, is, is in Missouri enlisting good old boys to supply caviar yeah. for the European market. Another, another unintended and terrible consequence of this was the archaeological evidence that was destroyed um, by uh, Truman Dam. The, the, as part of the mitigating funding that came through the lawsuit, the University of Missouri's archaeology department spent a couple of summers digging as fast and as deeply as they could to um, try to preserve and as much as they could of the various. Um, oh, there's, there was also some bogs, mm -hmm. which, uh, by the way, the Osages and the French knew about. The Osage uh, Indians were taken to, a, to a, uh, a circus early on, and they had a word for the elephants. They had a native word for elephants, and they were real puzzled be because they had seen mastodon tusks in these bogs mm -hmm. near, near Warsaw. So th this was a huge, uh, nationally, internationally significant bone find, and it was not completely excavated before the dam was built. The other thing that was missing within that area is that the, the fossil record of the plants, uh, of plant life and animal life goes back about 30 or 40,000 years. That's all destroyed, which in today's uh, era of climate change and concerns about how the uh, climate may be shifting would have been very uh, useful information, I would say, to have, but it's now underneath Truman Lake. Um, the bones, the fossils, casts of those fossil bones and of the mastodons are available for your perusal at the Truman uh, Visitor Center down near Warsaw. So, the, uh, go ahead. Trying to do it just one the time. The most uh, controversial aspect of, of Truman Dam, uh, beside the environmental, is the specious and crooked way the Corps of Engineers added pump storage feature in order to get their cost benefit up to the required one to one or more. They have to, you have to justify a federal project, that's a hard law. And they added what's called pump storage, which is the idea that you, at period of low electrical demand, the grid uses electricity to pump water back that you've previously used to generate electricity. Well, this works in mountain areas great. If you've got 600 foot ahead and crystal clear water in the Alps, pump storage is wonderful. It, you know, they use it all over Norway and Europe, you know, uh, but uh, it wasn't feasible. It, they knew it wasn't at, in the Osage River location. The idea that it would turn Lake of the Ozarks up and down 15 feet, the upper end of it, was ridiculous. People wouldn't put up with that. But they went ahead and installed it, and then they ran it once, and it it uh, it killed I don't know what was it tens of thousands tens of thousands of fish, it, it both was both below and above. Um, the they it's a slant. It's the generators are on a slant there because they miscalculated the depth of the bedrock, <laughs> and they couldn't get them in vertically the way they were supposed to go. So apparently, according to um, engineers we have talked to, that particular configuration has caused no end of maintenance problems. It continues to be, even though they don't run the pump back uh, feature anymore because of its um, effect on the environment, they still uh, have to maintain it and keep it. The <laughs> and they knew this would happen when they put them in. Let's go, oh, no, there, okay. So we, the, the big dam building era is pretty much over in the United States. They, they've uh, created a, a lot of opposition. They obviously had the Missouri Mississippi system is not free from, from uh, uh, damaging floods. 
Um, they, they've spent trillions of dollars. They've, they've covered over a lot of really valuable farmland, destroyed whole communities. So it, it, was, it was a mess. It was, it was a bad idea, and people knew it at the time. Many of which were in the Corps of Engineers, but they were not listened to. So the, the, after the, the effect of, uh, obviously, there, were, there wasn't stop. No, 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 we, I, it jumped up that one. Yeah, we, Merrimack. Yeah, Merrimack was stopped because uh, it, it was brilliantly uh, uh, prosecuted by the Sierra Club and, and several uh, people just made it their life's work to, to uh, uh, inform uh, St. Louis and uh, that this, this lovely little river was going to be turned into a, a, a lake built on top of caves, which would have leaked. So we had nothing to do with that, but the Corps of Engineers decided after having to go through this humiliating process, they hated this lawsuit, the idea of uh, bird kernels uh, being yelled at by federal judges, it's just not, it just doesn't work. They don't like it, you know. And uh, they, did, they do have to provide righteous environmental impact statements and people do get to make comments on them. So that process pretty put, much put an end to three dams they had planned for North Missouri. And the locals used our information to, to uh, fight them and the Corps just said, I'm not, not, they don't want to waste their time doing something that's not going to work. I give them credit for that. Of course, the court obeys the law. They're, they're not crooks. You know, they're just, they, when they get misguided by, by, by politicians who are misguided and, and just zealots who just identify dams with progress, then, then bad things happen. Okay. These are, the, the, this is a little lesson in image and reality. Uh, the romantic, the ideas are sold and pitched to local communities with the idea that there's going to be great be benefit to a community with this big project coming in. And there is it, often dancing in the heads of the local um, um, leaders, officials, are the ideas that something like Boulder Dam or Las Vegas or some sort of glamorous or more economically sound community will rise out of it. it. But in reality, that's inside the city limits of Clinton right now. And that's Truman Dam. That, that's about two feet deep out there and the car <laughs> won't even live, live in that water. We've, uh, we, we've written four books on Branson, which is a really interesting place, whether you like uh, uh, country music or not. It's just a lively, interesting place. And of course, the foundation of Branson was Harold Bell Wright's uh, romantic novel, uh, Shepherd of the Hills. And it, it, it's an interesting contrast between that and, and Truman Lake, for instance. They covered over the local history. They've, they've kind of tried to revive it with a, with a festival, what's it called? And Heritage Days. Heritage Days. At Warsaw. But it's, it's, uh, these artificial lakes are just like a parking lot for water. They don't have, but the, the beginnings of Branson had this Arcadian myth that, that led to a kind of a, a, a more successful, it's a more successful stable tourism in, in Branson than they're even <coughs> like in the Ozarks and certainly than Truman Dam. These, these Corps of Engineers lakes are pretty sterile and they're pretty, uh, uh, they do not create a huge tourist industry. Mm. I think I just went well. Um, there are after effects. I mean, the crappie, crappie fishing is good there. The, uh, at Truman, the, there's a lot of, you know, there's, there's, there's activity and people use it, not to the extent that Lake of the Ozarks or Table Rock or some of the other lakes, um, but it's, it's, uh, it's there. There's not much that else that can be said about it. There's still, there are still, uh, whoops. <laughs> there, this no, is the touchiest back. thing. Go back, uh -huh. go forward. Yeah. There's still catfish in it. The river is still buried underneath that water. So, um, what can I that's say? A, that's the, the paddlefish, uh, which, which could be a whole hour long. It's a very interesting species, it's, and it's far from endangered. It's just, it's just the problem of, of uh, genetic, uh, it has a genetic uh, problem. When our, our two boys were touring China, they went to a, a aquarium 
I don't remember the town or couldn't pronounce it. No, it was in Dolly Inn. Dolly Inn. Yeah. And there, there are Osage River paddlefish. The <laughs> origin of the, of the paddlefish throughout the world are eggs from the Osage River stock. So there, there are millions of paddlefish swimming in China and, and uh, Russia. And this is how we, we're reproducing paddlefish now. Um, the Chinese did have in the Yangtze River, the closest cousin to the paddlefish, the American paddlefish was in the Yangtze River, but Three Gorges Dam did, pretty well did that one in and there has not been a live one sighted for the last, I think, 10 years. Yeah, they grew to be 18 they were, feet long. They were truly big. So that would have something to do with the Chinese interest in uh, paddlefish today, I would think. So. Uh, and the, prob the problems never cease. There's, there's the bank erosion. We, we, we do cover the other, other dams on the Osage system briefly. The Stockton Dam, um, they, the Corps of Engineers installed a turbine twice the size that the stream bed would justify in order to get the cost-benefit ratio up. So their engineers knew that what the stream bed was. They were just surprised that it caused enormous amount of flooding. So they've been fighting with farmers and landowners down there since then. It causes drownings uh, when they release water from this oversized turbine. And it's destroyed a, one of the premier uh, archaic and, and paleo Indian sites in the United States. But they did excavate it they, and they did supply half a million dollars for, for uh, mitigation. So we're, uh, the, the symbolism and the, the mythos of dams has is, is definitely uh, been attacked by environmental and information acts and, uh, and even the Corps of Engineers is, uh, you know, there, every once in a while you read uh, a general in the Corps of Engineers quoting Thoreau. So I guess that's, that's progress, I guess. Although I'm not much on Thoreau, to be truthful. So we, we, we tried to summarize the, the, the kind of uh, scope of the last 300 years from the French and the Spanish and the early Americans and the Osage Indians into, into a, a brief and probably a bit pretentious statement about the nature of central governments. They, they kind of don't always take the local interests to heart. And sometimes the locals sitting there watching the river go by have a lot to offer if people would listen to them. There we go. And we've got an extensive website where Crystal posts, uh, I don't know what these things are, tweets? <laughs> no, I, I write blog posts on, um, they're nice because they're just self-standing little pieces and I've done everything from more on the Indians to souvenirs to, um, you reviewed a recent book out called Project 459, which was written by a woman in Kansas City. So we, we do it with, uh, we use our blog role to continue to update people on what we're doing, what the, um, what the state of water resources as we see it, or the history of the Osage Valley as we see it continues to be, or, or continues to unfold, because it's still an interesting place and it's still full of some very interesting people. And um, we'll continue to, to keep And uh, even if they build a lake, the river's still there. <laughs> the, there's some history there. It becomes new history. It's still interesting. And I, and I don't think people should, uh, I still find Lake of the Ozarks, uh, you know, uh, kind of perversely interesting. <laughs> I've, I've fished all over it, and uh, my family's involved in, in resorts. Mm -hmm businesses, you know, whatever, but it's, so we're not really down on, on, on recreation. Anybody who writes four books on Branson is not too pointy headed, huh? <laughs> Does anybody have questions? Yeah, I still have a question. I have those Asian cars pushed up into that last 80 miles of the Jose River, mm -hmm. in your knowledge. Uh, the reason I bring that up is uh, some friends of mine in the Missouri Department of Conservation that that old block block and dam that number one mm -hmm. some of them think that's keeping the asian car from moving up further from the, the missouri river and the I question is about the asian that. car it, it, our, the question is are the asian carp in the in that 80 miles of river uh i don't think it's their habitat they're plankton feeders and and i don't think uh either of those species to my knowledge 
have got a toehold. As far as that dam blocking that particular fish, no, it wouldn't. They, they, they could get up that uh, runway very so fish are, Each species is totally different in its response to a dam like that. Paddlefish hate it, and, and, and the sturgeon, both species of sturgeon, don't like it either. In high water, both of them can go over it, but the Asian carp, my understanding, the Asian carp are pretty adroit at going up waterfalls. And, and the, the, through the open channel there, I think they go right up. It wouldn't be any barrier at all. Uh, the other thing I was going to, the Fish and Wildlife Service out of Columbia does spend every spring uh, going up and down the Missouri River uh, locating cattle fish and, uh, in the Missouri River and uh, finding pregnant females and try to harvest the eggs out of them with the, with the idea to look for wild strains so that they can collect that genetic material and introduce it back into the hatchery. They, that's right. They, they do they know. They are concerned about that problem. They do, know, they, do, they do are aware of it, but it's just a question of the Conservation Department being uh, wanting to spend the money to do it. They've got a pretty good system. I mean, they're masters at reproducing these. I mean, it's a trick, and they're, they're great. But uh, whether or not they, they would want to uh, invest that much money if the federal something, government right now is spending that money on those uh, to try and collect that with the, because they're an endangered species. Well, that's, that's a, and, and another solution would be, you know, to get rid of that dam and encourage <laughs> the, the, the spawn, the natural spawning. Well, you can't guarantee that federal large, yes, right. the money flow will continue any more than the, you know, the water flow after a dam right. is built, so that allowing a species to, um, Reproduce itself might be more cost effective in the long run, and the, more and more likely to have success. In the the, these run. rivers could be re-engineered to be more compatible to natural spawning, even above above Truman Dam. There are, there are some there is occasionally some some spawning has been recorded, but it, but if there was some water manipulation from the dams above above there, and and this would have to. For the, for the lower part of the, of the Osage River to work, they'd have to get Union Electric or, or Amaranth to, to uh, regulate the flow for a few weeks, which might take a federal act, which could happen. Well, I'll tell you, the Army Corps of Engineers have been trying to alter the Missouri River a little bit to encourage natural spawning, and that's met with a great deal of uh, the most resistance in the entire Missouri Basin to that effect. Those projects is the state of Missouri. <laughs> it's 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 very contentious. Anything to do with water? I mean, wars were fought over water before 5,000 BC. Yes. Do you know the date of that picture that was on your original screen of the mouth of the old state? Oh, the, the aerial photograph? Yeah. That's one of the few, pic the only picture that we didn't take besides the historic photograph. I bought that from a guy and I think he did it in uh, the early 80s. It looks like it's way back further than that to me because it's a totally different. It's pretty dynamic. It, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be before the 60s though. The mountain was the third the mountain of the Osage. The Missouri runs right adjacent to the railroad track, and on that picture, there's some space in between there with some water poles and whatever. So I'm curious as to when that picture might have been taken. Yeah, I thought early 80s, late 70s, mm -hmm. but I, I'm not sure. It's, it was a stock photograph. It was. Uh... Yes, sir. Uh, I wanted to comment. Your slide on the Merrimack Dam and so forth brought mm -hmm. back uh, memories. I was involved in the fight to stop that dam. Good for you. We yeah. had an organization called Man Dam, Missourians <laughs> against, had a t-shirt. <laughs> but we fought the good fight and, and stopped that dam. Uh, there were a couple things with Merrimack. It wasn't very deep into construction. Uh, it was close to St. Louis. It was close to St. Louis's heart. And they ran a brilliant both media and political campaign against it. They didn't use We're NEPA. in awe. At, at yeah, the, we're at very the, impressed political acumen of people that stopped Merrimack Dam. It was, yeah, it was unfortunately, brilliant. Unfortunately, I moved out of state before the final election occurred. I mean, <laughs> by just a couple of months, so I got to read about it in the paper. Uh -huh. Yeah, no, that's, that was a great a great effort and well done. Yeah. Was it Henry or Harry Mills in Clinton? And how is he related to, or is he related to Kathleen White Mills? 
And what was his role? Harry Mills, I don't know the relationship to you. I don't think they're related. She's a historian over there. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't think there's any relation. I'm, I'm sure there are. There is not, in fact. I've, I've inquired into that. And what side was he on in the, in the fight? He, he was a pro dam person. He, he had a, 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 he was a, what you'd call a true believer in just the benefit of regulated rivers. He wasn't associated with the newspaper? Uh, Harry Mills, no. Uh, I don't think so. Thank you. No, I, yeah, he was that, an insurance, are, I they're, they're, They weren't related, yeah. The other, they're, they're just yeah. two, had the same names. Um, but Harry Mills was also on the Missouri Conservation Commission. Yeah, he, he, was, he was both the president of MOARC and a Missouri Department of it, uh, Commission commissioner, one of the four commissioners, who are very powerful. Yeah. And so he had sort of a conflict of interest. And he threatened to fire all the biologists if they gave testimony in, in, in the thing, uh, to which the federal judge said, you what? <laughs> you think you're going to do what? You what? <laughs> you're, you're going to determine who testifies in, the, in this federal case? J judge Aller wasn't particularly uh, favorably disposed toward us, but he was a very strict judge, and, and the power of a federal judge is awesome. <laughs> In his, in his chamber, and he chain smoked, so we didn't have much out in front of the, of the crowd, so he could use his colorful language in, in court, chain smoking uh, Winston's, you know, back uh, back there. Not not in court, He they would do a lot of behind the scenes. Behind, in, in the woodshed, he called it, you know. But he, but he was, he was, he was a, a judge that was very rarely overruled. He, he knew the law. <laughs> but very colorful and uh, he imposed his will on uh, Harry Mills and, and the, you know, anybody that uh, the Corps of Engineers, you know, at, at one point, uh, he, you know, I, he said, uh, I think I want that paper there. Can you get that for 10 o'clock tomorrow, that information to me? And the, and the Colonel Needham said, oh, I don't know. So like that. He says, well, you guys got these, all these airplanes in the service. You can get that general out here on that airplane at 10 o'clock in the morning. We'll have a talk about that. The, he said, well, I think, let me look into that, Your Honor. <laughs> so he had the papers the next morning. He was going to have a, a general in Washington, D.C. come out and explain it to him. <laughs> if those are all the questions, I want to have the audience give you a thank, uh, thank you, and uh, let's hear a nice <laughs>